I still see a lot of value in fossil fuels. I think because the political class is doing their very best to decapitalize the oil and gas business. While Mr. Biden is suggesting to oil companies that they should produce more, he's telling them he's going to put them out of business in 2030. That's not a really good way to bring a lot of capital into the business. It is estimated by the International Energy Agency that the oil and gas business worldwide is deferring about a billion dollars a day in sustaining capital investments, which means that they are underinvesting $360 billion a year, which wow. means that their ability to produce is going to decline. Paradoxically, what Mr. Biden is doing is making sure that we have to pay high prices for oil uh, and maintain very good margins for oil producers for a long time. The trick is to find oil and gas companies that generate reasonable earnings while still investing in the sustaining capital investments necessary to maintain their production. Uh, and those companies still exist. When I say the big thinkers, I'm being sarcastic. That noted energy phys physicist Greta Thornburg, our president <laughs> as an example, has suggested that uh, peak oil demand will occur in about 2030. My suspicion is that will occur in 2045 or 2050 and then tail off from that. So when I do a net present value calculation, I don't write it down to zero at 2030 because the oil and business will be alive and robust. Let me give you uh, a statistic that I think will support this. Goldman Sachs suggests that the world has now invested $4.6 trillion in alternative energies in the last 40 years. And they've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from 82% to 81% after an investment of $4.6 trillion. How much capital might it take to reduce oil's market share substantially from here? And where might that money come from? We've seen some of the alternatives. The Germans decided in their wisdom to phase out power that worked, uh, which is to say nuclear, uh, in favor of solar in the far north where the sun doesn't shine. The consequence of that is that their power prices are up by 500% and they still suffer blackouts. The dichotomy between the political positions of the big thinkers and the needs and wants of ordinary human beings around the world suggests to me that the oil and gas business is a good place to be. Particularly perhaps now in the United States where markets have worked and the price of natural gas has fallen by 60%. That's caused the prices of the best natural gas producers in this hemisphere in this continent to sell off fairly substantially, despite the fact that major investments are being made in natural gas transmission and, and in the fabrication and construction of nat uh, natural gas liquids plants to export this uh, this product to Europe. So I, I, I'm I mean, still attracted wow. to the oil and gas business. Now, listen, th three years ago, we had an extraordinary circumstance where the political winds were blowing against oil and gas, but then COVID came and knocked out demand too. The oil prices, you'll recall, fair, fell to sub-zero. I remember saying uh, at the time, one's uh, investment outlook around oil could be determined by one question. And that was three or four years hence, when the listener went out to the garage and turned the key to the right, would their car start or not? Because at $20 in oil, $20 a barrel oil, there wasn't going to be supply of oil in five years. It needed to go above 60. So the choice at the time was, if you believe that your car wouldn't start in five years, you shouldn't own oil stocks. If you did believe that your car would start uh, in five years, you had to buy oil stocks because the oil price had to go from $20 a barrel to $60 a barrel. Of course, it didn't. It went to 100 before re re returning down to 70. Markets work. Oil is an extremely efficient uh, fuel, uh, particularly for vehicle transport. The future that we envision, which is to say more demand for all forms of energy, will necessitate enormous inputs of natural resources. Every part of the value chain that isn't intellectual capital is physical capital. It's either grown or mined. Those are your two choices. As a society, we've been underinvesting in productive capacity and mining for 30 years, just at the point in time where both demographics and technology point to increased consumption of minerals. The most important electricity metal is copper. Copper gets stuff from the generator to the house, and then it distributes stuff through the house and through the car. Through the car. And your focus on technology around the efficient use of energy is a wonderful thing. I do simpler things. But let's <laughs> let's return 
to the subject at hand. I'm sort of an icon for the copper business in the sense that I'm 70 years of age. The median big copper mine in the world is beginning to look like me, which is to say aged and long of tooth. Bingham Canyon, the biggest copper mine in the United States, 160 years old. Chuki Kamada, 120 years old. Erzberg, 60 years old. Uh, Escondida, 45 years old. You don't stand at the top of a pit, throw in water and fertilizer and have the thing grow more copper. That's not the way it works. Uh, but we haven't invested. Uh, on a global basis in exploration, in construction, in development, in the copper business for a very, very, very long time. And it isn't all, although importantly, it is technology. There are about a billion people on Earth that have no access to electricity at all. There's another two billion people on Earth, the poorest of the poor, that have access to either unaffordable uh, or intermittent electricity. Are we going to need more solar? You betcha. Wind? Yep, that too. Coal? be with us for a very long time. Oil and gas, nuclear, all of the above. Not just for technology, but because we need to continue to do a good job advancing the material lives of the poorest of the poor. Those people want to live like you and I live, and we live a very energy dense life, and we want to live better. I, I need to say that 50 years investing in natural resources uh, has made me sort of a connoisseur of political risk. But I will say that there are a few countries in the world that are really managing uh, their economic emergence uh, as a consequence of resources. Well, Chile did it, although Chile is now with a socialist government trying to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. This next country may be too small to play. Uh, Guyana, uh, with less than a million people, now has 7 billion recoverable barrels of oil. The state taken that will be over 50%, approaching 60%. If you assume a $20 margin over 20 years on 7 billion barrels of oil, you understand something about the social rents that will flow to a small company like country like Guyana. Politicians seem to have a facility for wasting vast amounts of money. That opportunity seems almost probably not a word, unblowable. I think it'll probably have a, a, a happy a happy outcome for them. The narrative around Africa is, of course, war, AIDS, Ebola, poverty. Uh, but the African middle class is the most rapidly growing middle class in the world. Many African economies are growing at 6 or 7% compounded. I spend a lot of time in Africa because I'm involved in extractive businesses. And what I like to point out to Western investors is the incredible inventory of human resources in Africa, the incredible technologists, the incredible uh, entrepreneurs, all the way down to the market ladies who I wish were running those countries, <laughs> uh, to the <laughs> geologists, to the engineers. Africa is going to be a very, very, very bumpy road because Africa has too much government activity relative to economic activity. You have to go to places where the competition is afraid to enter. That's Africa. <laughs> so uh, I'm very attracted to Africa. I, I mean, I need to say in terms of cash in, cash out, the best country in my memory has been Chile. But the second best country in my memory has been Congo.